about JavaScript. How do you do that? You Googled it. Well, yeah. What else did you do? You clicked on view source, didn't you? You went to a site, and you saw it do something that you wanted, want to do in your own application. And you said, that's interesting. And you did a view source. And what did it do? It showed you JavaScript. It didn't show you JavaScript. It showed you stinking, nasty JavaScript. And the first reaction you had is, who in the right mind would write it? And then you came back after two days later and you said, but I still have to get this work done. And you found a way to solve the problem. You said, I don't have to deal with it. So you copied and pasted it. And it worked. And you said, I'm done. I don't have to maintain this now, right? And then somebody comes to your site, view sources, and they're scared. And they come back after two days and they say, I don't have to do this. They copied and pasted your code. And then the cycle repeats. And then we have a world full of programmers who hate JavaScript. And yet we do it. There's only two things we hate and we still use, JavaScript and politics. <laughs> right? <laughs> we, both, we, we know we can live with either one of them, so we kind of put up with it. But it doesn't have to be. And you may probably would say, you're kidding, but I really mean it. JavaScript is a beautiful language. But remember, beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. So you got to kind of look at it and say, it really is beautiful. And if you stay with it long enough, you will start loving it. And so you'll start caring it. So absolutely, it's a beautiful language. And what I'm going to show you here is that it really is beautiful and things that you can do with it. So JavaScript is a very powerful language. And as I said before, it's often hated. And it suffers browser inconsistency. Some browsers work one way, others work another way. It's a language that's probably the most misunderstood languages of all languages. Um, a lot of us use JavaScript, and we don't even get to the depth of the language. And developers find it very painful. We, we kind of say, we got to do it. It's kind of like going to the dentist, right? You don't go to the dentist because you say, I like being here. You're like, get the work done so I can leave. It's kind of like that. And you know, tool support, how do you debug JavaScript? Printf, right? Print. You print it out, you alert boxes all over, right? That's what we do, unfortunately. It's hard. And you cannot think of a language with a poorer name. I, 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 if, if somebody named you like that, how would you feel? <laughs> right? They named you after your uncle that you despise the most. And anytime they call your name, you feel like, I don't want to have his name with a little thing. But that's what JavaScript. But this was purely a marketing ploy. They said, hey, this is ECMAScript. Hey, but Java is out there gaining popularity. Let's say JavaScript sold. And all of a sudden, everybody thought, this is cool language to use. It's just like Java, right? Well, not really, but we, we decided to use it that way. Um, so having said that, in reality, however, it's a very elegant language. It is a very powerful language. It actually is object-oriented in a number of ways. And it's a very expressive language. We're going to see some of those here today. First problem is it feels a little bit like Java, but a lot like C also. Uh, it's got some similarities to Perl. Any parts that you hate, you know where it came from. It's an untyped language. It's not just a dynamically typed language. That's the difference, right? A dynamically typed language figures the type when you run it. A great example of that is language like Ruby. Ruby knows what types are. You just don't type your type in the code. It figures it out. And if you try to mistreat the object as a wrong type, it will tell you that, hey, it's a wrong type. I don't understand uh, the type you're you know, treating it as. Well, JavaScript is not like that. JavaScript is not dynamically typed. It's untyped. It says, I don't care what the type is. It's garbage in, garbage out. You want to treat it as an object, treat it as an object. Everything is an object in this language. And that's all it cares about. It doesn't care about real typing. Well, JavaScript is case sensitive. So we've got to be careful how we name our variables. And if you give two variables with uh, different cases, 
You could be in trouble using it, so you've got to be careful. Uh, it's generally a good idea to put semicolons in the code. You know, it's, it's optional, but it can hurt you if you don't put it in proper places. It's a good idea to put semicolons in the code generally uh, to separate the statements. And you could use a C and a C++ and Java style commenting uh, to comment the code if you want to comment them. In terms of types themselves, um, you, if you don't declare a variable and you try to use it, it becomes undefined. Uh, some people will say, that's bad. Other people have a nice name for it. It's very forgiving. These are euphemism, right? You say the bad thing in a nice way. It, feel, it makes you feel better. The language is forgiving, <laughs> meaning it's going to hurt you where you don't want it to be hurt. So you, you need to make sure you define things properly, otherwise it can be pretty messy, right? So let's look at an example here. I'm going to simply say print, and I'm going to print foo, some variable foo. I want to print it out. Um, so basically, in this case, it's going to take this variable and print it. So what, what happens if you don't define variables, right? We've got to be careful with variables that you use. Uh, it's going to give undefined, and I'm not sure why it didn't give me undefined. We'll have to see this here. So basically, you've got to be careful in, in typing things and, and giving it proper variables. We'll see that a little later on. We should be able to see an example where it tells us it's undefined. Strings can have a single quote or a double quote. So you could, you could quote them uh, as a single quote. I, I'm a huge fan of using single quote in a lot of places, uh, mainly because it's ne less noisy. And I'm used to a language like Groovy where you can use single quote. So I kind of get used to it. And I'm, I'm a huge fan of having less noise. Strings are immutable, uh, so which is a good thing. But what's really exciting about JavaScript is JavaScript is a functional language in a lot of ways. And oftentimes, we don't realize it. And, and we get excited about a lot of languages that are functional, but we've had this with us for quite a long time. Well, what is a functional language? A functional language is a language where functions are first-class citizens. You can, you know how you create an object and you pass this object to a function? You can create a function and pass the function to other functions. How you can create objects within functions, you can create functions within functions. Just like how you would create objects and return them from functions, you could create functions and return functions from functions. So this gives you a way to decompose your application with functions. One of the things that happened, sadly, over the past 15, 20 years is we got excited about this object oriented programming. And object oriented programming took us the wrong path and kind of dumbed us down and we started believing that everything should be object-oriented, but not true. There are decent applications we can build simply using functional composition, and you can certainly do that in a language like JavaScript. So first-class citizens are functions. You can pass these functions around to other functions. And variables are typeless. I talked about this. And again, you need to declare variables. Even though that's optional, it's a good idea to declare these variables in the code. And then they have scope. And once again, if you don't put a var, your variables take on a global scope. And that can give you side effects that you didn't expect. And, and it can mess up things in a very bad way. So JavaScript is a language that expects you to have discipline. And if you don't have discipline, uh, it is not going to help you and say, no, 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 don't do that. It would just wait and watch you fall and fail. And then eventually you realize, I don't want to do that. And then you kind of, you know, it's a, it's a language that has tough love, right? It lets you fail and then recover from it, then trying to protect you at that point. So how do you deal with very similar to it? So you say for a variable name in whatever object, and then you can start iterating over it. But we'll look at a couple of different options, how differently we could do this. So I want to create a function. How do I create a function? So if you want to create a function, you, you write a function. And let's say our function is called, say, you know, hello. And this is going to take a name of some kind to say hello. So I'm going to say print. And I'm going to simply say here, hello, uh, plus the name, right? Pretty simple. And, and I'm going to simply call say hello. And let's say over here, uh, jits. So I'm going to simply call this function and ask it to execute it. That simple it is. You just write a function. It's very lightweight. And, and, and you would be either frightened about it or you love it. There's nothing in between, right? Either you hate it or you love it. 
And the reason you would hate it is, you're going to look at this and say, oh my god, you didn't tell what these types are. You didn't tell me what these variable types are. And yeah, that could be very alarming to some of us. But if you have programmed in language like Ruby or Groovy, this is the way you write code in those languages, and you kind of begin to accept it. Now, I have to tell you this. If you caught me about, let's say, seven, eight years ago, and you told me that I should write code in a dynamically typed language or in a typeless language, I would be the baby sitting there kicking and screaming and crying because I know this code is horrible, very difficult to maintain it. Today, I love it. And why is that? What, what changed? The main thing that changed is discipline. And there was a time when I used to work in companies where we wrote code, and as soon as I finished writing code, my boss would get excited. Hey, is the code compiling? Yeah, I'll ship it, right? Because if the code compiles, you ship it. Well, we kind of got a little wiser along the way. We said, well, there's something called making sure it works. And the boss would try to convince you, but that's what the users are for, right? I mean, if it doesn't work, they're going to tell you. I mean, we need a support team after all. Well, why do we have them otherwise? And then you realize that's not the way to really release products. Maybe we should test it. And it's better to even write some automated tests. Why? Because I know, I'm sure you have this problem, right? I, I'm, I'm sure I have this problem. My code always does what I type, not what I meant, right? The code doesn't come to me and say, is that what you really meant? No, it's off running and doing what I typed. And how many times you say, don't it, that's not what I meant. And the code says, but how do I know? I'm not reading your mind. I'm reading your keystrokes, right? So you start understanding, maybe there's a bit of a redundancy we have to introduce. Maybe I should start writing unit tests. Now, you may think about this and say, yeah, nice theory, Venkat. Thanks for sharing that. But how in the world do you write unit tests on Java code, or JavaScript code, rather? And it's, it's, it's right there in the HTML page. How do you unit test it? Well, we'll talk about that. And I'll come back and show you how you could do that. And, but again, that takes discipline. But once I learned about unit testing, I realized I don't rely on the compiler to support me. I write code and make sure it works. So that doesn't scare me at all, right? And so it's a discipline. You write code and make sure it works by writing automated unit tests. And then you make a code change and immediately run through unit tests and make sure it still works. Then you don't have to worry about it. So that's basically how you could write a function. But it gets better. While you can write functions like this, that's not as exciting as you can create functions. Remember I mentioned that functions are first class citizens? Well, if functions really are first class citizen, you can do something like this, right? You could pretty much say, for example, you could write code, you could say var, you know, age equals, maybe we could say 12, somebody's age is 12, right? I could say that. And, and that should be able to, you know, initialize it, no problem. But if this is really a first class citizen, why not say, say hello equals, and this time I'm going to write a function and assign to that variable, right? Why not? If it's a first class citizen, you should be able to do it. And at first sight, you may say, yeah, but what's the fun in doing it? Well, it's enormously powerful because now you don't have a function, you have a handle to a function. And the minute you have a handle to a function, you can pass it around. You can call into other functions and say, here you go. I'm giving you a handle to a function. You can go use it, right? So it becomes very powerful to pass it around. If you're registering events, now you can create a function as a variable, and then you can register it to other functions. So this becomes extremely useful when you're writing HTML or HTML5. What you can do is you can say, well, here is an you know, element, like an input or whatever. And I want to register an event with it, like a click event. Well, how can I register? I could say my you know, element dot on click equals. Now you're saying function parentheses event, and you're writing the function. See how easy it became because you have the my element dot you know, on click equals, and now you just drop the function in there. And that function has no name. And we call it as an anonymous function. Anonymous function are functions that don't have name. And, and functions, basically, in that case, what happens? If you really think about it, a function has four things, right? A function has a name, a function has a body, a function has a parameter list, and a function has a return or a return type in a statically typed language. 
JavaScript says, hey, this is a function. I don't care about the name for the function. Well, I don't need to give a name to it. So the most important thing, obviously, is the body of the function, which you have. And the parameter list can be given, but you don't have to specify the types. And the return type ha doesn't have to be specified. You can simply return something from the function. Let's go back to this function for a second. What if I go to this function, and I'm going to say print, line, print and I'm going to print out the value from this. And let's just put a little slash n over here so it, it appears on a separate line so we can actually see it. So notice it said hello, you know, gets, and then it says undefined. Well, why is it undefined? I promised I'll come to undefined later on. Well, say hello is not returning anything. And then as a result, it says it's undefined. Now, this is something we tend to forget sometimes, but this has a very significant effect on how we write code. When you look at languages like C++ or Java, unfortunately, these languages separate statements from expressions. And so I'm sure in your vocabulary, you would say that is an if statement, right? Whereas you may say this is an expression which does multiplication. Well, you may not think much about it, but that really hurts in the long run because now you're dealing with statements which don't return any values, and then you have expressions which are completely separate. But languages like JavaScript, everything is an expression. There are no statements. Then what happens is anything can return value. In this case, if it doesn't have a return value, it gives you, a, you know, undefined. But it really makes things more natural. You can just pass them around and build code. It gives a nice composition of functions more effectively. So, so it's something we can't take very lightly. On the other hand, if I were to go back over here, and maybe I want to return something from here. Maybe with the, with, instead of printing, I, I could return, right? I could say hello uh, plus name. Now, I'm used to programming in language like Groovy and Groovy, so I tend to forget to put the word return. And, and so it still says undefined, where, whereas you, know, you say return, and it's probably a good idea to put a semicolon as well right at there in the end. And you can see that that's returning that value. And I'm able to print it out on the other side. So that's basically how you could write functions. And not only can you write functions, you can also assign it to variables. And then as a result, you can pass them around. And, and that gives you the benefit of taking these functions, anonymous functions, and registering them as event handlers. And that just becomes much more easier to use because of the ability to do that. So that is basically an example of how you would write functions. But you can create classes. Now, I know you probably are like, hmm, why would you create classes? Well, for the same reasons why you create classes in any other language. You want to group a bunch of methods together, and you can have them do some work for you. So if you want to create classes in JavaScript, you can create classes in JavaScript. Nothing stops you from doing it. Um, how do you do that? So I want to create a class called car. Let's see how I'm going to create it. Pretty simple. So let's go back over here and create a class. So I'm going to say class car. Nah, you're not going to do that in JavaScript. JavaScript is functional, right? Everything is a function. This is a function car. And I want an ear for the car. So you say ear. And now you have created a class called car. I know you're saying, come on, come on, come on. You wrote a function called car. Yeah, but it's also a class. So why can't it be a class? It says I'm a function, but not only am I a function, but I can also accrue other functions. It's I'm a first class citizen. So I will have all the capabilities of anything else. So you wrote a function, but you wrote a class. And it's a class that you can use. Uh, does that light flickering mean something? OK, it flickers again. Does anybody know what it means? If that means run, let me know, and I'll be the first to run. No? OK, all right, it's not flickering anymore. Um, so I, I know the minute you talk serious stuff in JavaScript, kinds like this happen, right? <laughs> what can I do? OK, so you can write classes, certainly. So now I want to create an instance of it. So what do I do? I say variable my car equals. New car, that sounds familiar, isn't it? So I create a new instance of this function. And if it hurts a little bit, that's natural at this point, 
right? That means you're going through the learning curve of JavaScript. That's pretty healthy. It doesn't kill anybody. People have survived that. Just stay with it. But it's nicely flowing into, you have created an instance of this function, and let's say 2011, and I could simply print uh, over here my car. And when I, when I do that, you know, I'll use my own advice here to put semicolon. And notice it says you got an object on hand. So nothing stops you from creating classes and creating instances of it. Uh, what you don't want to ask is the same syntax that you're used to in other languages. That's unfair, right? So you just need to know that's the syntax of the language and be happy with that syntax and use it uh, you know, judiciously. You say, okay, that's nice, but I want to set the ear. What do I do? This dot ear equals ear. So now I can come to this car and say, hey car, what year were you made in? And it tells me my car was made in the year 2011. So I'm able to go query for the property's value, and I can print it, right? Makes sense, right? And one of the things you notice is it's lightweight. You didn't have to do a lot of work. And then that's probably one of the things that bothers us, right? Because it's got to make things hard. Hey, where's my public, private, protected? Well, everything is public. Why should everything be public? Well, why not? And this is one of the things you will see programmers say, oh, I want it public because nobody can change it. Tell me which language you want me to change private variables in. Every language allows you to change private variables. You just have to be nice to it and say, please. And it says, OK, please. You are my friend. I can let you change my private variables, right? That's what it says. Um, don't even go there, Scott. OK. <laughs> So, so basically the point is encapsulation really is not about security. Encapsulation is never about putting boundaries on access. It's all about code maintainability. And JavaScript really is intended for a very different purpose, so you don't need that kind of encapsulation in your code. There are other ways you can achieve it if you really need to. So, so I can create this and get the variable really well. All right, that's good so far. But I want to write a function for this particular object. I want to be able to use it. How do I do that? So you say car dot prototype. Let's just stop there for a second. Now, this is the beauty. This is as if, you know, I walk around with my backpack, and you could come to me and say, hey, what's your name? I'll tell you what my name is. But you could tell me, hey, do you have a laptop? Well, not really with me, but I got it in my backpack, right? So I carry my stuff around, and I could be in an airplane, and we are at the cruising altitude. I may reach into my laptop bag, pull up my laptop, start working on it. But when I'm done, I could put it back and carry it around. So the function says, hey, I could have a prototype. So I often think of a prototype as a backpack. So there's a bunch of collections that you can hold. This collection can have properties. This collection can have methods. And here is the beauty. You call a function on a function. I know this is a bit odd to think about it. But you call a function on the object. What this object says is, if I have it, I will do it for you. If I don't have it, I'm going to reach into my backpack prototype and see if I have it. And if it is there, I'm going to run that for you. So the prototype becomes this area where it reaches. So any method that's not defined on the function, any method that's not defined on the object, is routed to the prototype for execution at this point. If the prototype has it, you can, you can use it. So what am I going to do here? I say uh, car.prototype.drive. Well, before that, let's, let's before that, before we go that, go there, let's comment that out for a second. And I'm going to say this.miles equals zero, right? I'm just initializing the miles. We could even print the miles. So print my car dot miles. And that tells us that the miles is zero right there, right? Um, so basically at that point, let's go ahead and say, well, usually in a web application, you don't have these concerns to put plus n. And so you could do that. And you could say what the value is, and you could have the zero. But what I really want to do is, I want to have a drive method because I want to drive this car around, right? So what am I going to do? So prototype drive equals function. See, notice how that is helpful now to start injecting functions into this prototype. So you say function takes a distance that I want to drive this car around. 
And what am I going to do here? Let's say print driving. So we can just start with that. So now I could say my car dot drive, let's say 10, and it says driving. But I want to take some actions in here. So what am I going to do? So I go up here and say this dot miles plus equals distance. Now I have increased the distance. That should be pretty straightforward, right? Because that's how you would write code in Java or C sharp in all these languages. So it looks very similar to it. So now that I have driven this car, my car dot miles, and I want to print the miles right here so I can know how many miles I have driven this. And you can see that it prints out the miles it's been driven. If I want to put that, we can see that up here on the next line. So that's how simple it is to write classes in JavaScript. So once you understand that this is what it does, you no longer have a fear for this language, right? You know this is a beast you can tame very easily because it's not a whole lot of different from what we already know. It just requires a bit more discipline in using it. That's what you're seeing here. So that is basically an example of how you could write a class and you can start writing methods on it. You want another method on this? Sure. You can say car dot prototype dot and you could say tune if you want to tune the car, right? And then I'm going to simply say here equals and I could say function. Maybe I don't want to pass any parameters to it. So I could say print line, uh, print, and I could say tuning. Um, and so I could write more methods on it. So now I could come here and say uh, my car dot tune and you can call the method for tuning. So that becomes pretty easy to do. You can keep adding methods to it. So these basically are collections of methods that you put on the prototype, the backpack of this object, and it says, all right, I can, I can deal with that. I can give you that. So that becomes pretty easy, isn't it? So that's basically how you can write functions. You say, okay, that's nice, uh, classes, but I want to create objects. You say new to create objects. You want to set property values. You say object dot some property name equals value. You want to get the value. You say object dot some property name. You got the value. You want to call a method on it. You say some method parentheses and put the parameters. You saw me do all the three things a little bit before, right? But there is something else you can do. Now, if you're writing an application, and for a minute, think about this. You're in a web application, or you are in a more of a dynamic setting, and you got these property names in a form, maybe. Or you have this property name in a file, maybe. Now, the problem with the dot notation is it's not flexible, right? Because you have to give the name for it. And you sit there and scratch your head, but I don't know the name. Because the name could be configured. I want this to be dynamic. And so how do you really deal with this? So it's kind of like you meet somebody, you ask them what the name is, and then you call them with the name that you just heard. You can't possibly know what their name is ahead of time, right? If you do, uh, something else is going on. Right? So you don't know what their name is, and they tell you what the name is. Now you're talking to them with the name. Well, the problem with the dot notation is there's no way you can come and change that and insert their name at this point. That's not going to happen. Well, thankfully, JavaScript gives you such a beautiful flexibility to do this. So notice what I'm going to do. I'm going to say over here, I don't want to get the ear as print ear, my car dot ear. You could do that if you want to. Notice it says 2011. But what I can actually do instead is I could say print my car and access it as a collection. And simply say year, where that could come in as a parameter. Now, see, notice that how beautiful that is, right? Because it's a double coded string. What that means is it could be a variable that you load up from a file or whatever. And now you can start throwing these on it. And it's pretty dynamic, right? So this gives you the ability to dynamically receive things. So you don't have to worry about what this object's content is ahead of time. You can make this very flexible. You look at your form, you've got a file, look at even a user typing stuff, and you receive that, and then you fire up the method on it, and he says, I can handle it. So again, this is one thing I appreciate quite a bit in JavaScript, is the ability for you. Try doing that in Java. How do you do that? How do you do that in Java? Reflection. Well, it's not reflection. It's reflection with 
20 lines of try-catch block <laughs> that you don't care about, right? And by the time you're done with it, it's time to go home, right? No wonder we need seven months to write a, a two lines of code, right? You write all that stuff around it, whereas this says, I'm pretty flexible. Just throw it at me, and I'm going to respond to you. This gives you quite an interesting flexibility for you to deal with. So that is basically how you can. So what does that tell you? What that tells you is, earlier I said an object is nothing but a function. Now I'm changing my story. An object is nothing but a, just a collection, a property collection. An object says, I simply hold properties and values. Now you know why JSON exists, right? Not, not your pal JSON sitting next to you. I'm talking about the JavaScript object notation. What is that? That simply says an object is nothing but a name value pair. Why is that possible? That's because that's what your objects are. And, and so, you know, if you really, really think about it, it will make you cry because that's the beauty. It's so simple. It says I'll morph myself. I, I'm not going to put ceremonies around you. You tell me. You want me to be an object, I will be. You want me to be a function, I'll be. You want me to be just a collection of these property values, I'll be. And it's so flexible. That's the beauty of it. It's very flexible for doing that. Well, if that is the case, why not even make this more flexible? So notice what I'm going to do. I go to this object, and I say for variable property in my car dot proto. So now I can ask him to print the prop. So essentially what we are telling him is to go through the object and get you all the properties. And you know this from reflection, correct? You could do this in Java and C Sharp. You can just ask it to give you method uh, types and uh, what is called method info and property info in C Sharp or method and field and properties in, in um, um, Java. But you're able to get these things from this object. So what does that mean? That means you can just walk up to an object and query it. And you can say, what do you have? You know, this is like you know, going, sitting next to somebody in a train on an airplane. You sit next to them and you kind of smile. And if they smile at you, the journey is going to be pleasant. Otherwise, it's going to be a very long journey. And if they smile at you, you say, do you like music? Right? Now the person says, yes, I do. Then you say, what kind of music do you like? You're building a conversation based on querying you're not going with, you know, I, I've read about you before, right? The guy freaks out. He runs away. So you kind of get into a conversation. Hey, what do you like? What do you do? And then now you start talking about common interests. So you're just dealing with this feels more human-like in that way, right? You can query this object, and then you can operate on it. So that's what we did. But if you want methods and not these properties, you could go to it and ask for these methods also. We'll see in just a few minutes how you could do that. So we were able to access these properties just by names using a, a double coded string, and that gives us quite an interesting flexibility. And we also saw how to create classes, so I'll move on. I showed this to you already. And you saw how to add a method, so we created a simple class. And you can get the prototype, I showed you that. But you can also get a method on this object by simply going through the method in object underscore underscore prototype. If you want the properties, you could go to that and get the properties as well. And you could get these different values. So you could say property in object will give you all the properties. This can give you the methods. You say, OK, that's all nice, but I want my inheritance. Right? Well, the first thing to think about is inheritance is not very popular. We kind of made it popular. But inheritance is one of the most abused concepts in object-oriented programming. There is a research study that says that inheritance causes ulcer among programmers. You don't want to use it. Well, the reason is inheritance ties you to this object, and it becomes painful to change it. What is really, really important in object oriented programming is not inheritance, but polymorphism. And polymorphism says, call a method on an object, we'll try to figure out what the real type of the object is, and we will call that for you at runtime. Inheritance is purely a mechanism to reuse methods. And, and almost everybody here, I'm sure, has read a good design book. And what does a good design book say? It says composition is better than inheritance. 
And we say, yep, that's a wonderful thing. Thank you for saying it. We put down the book, and what do we do? Use inheritance. <laughs> like, why? Because how do you do composition in Java? Correct answer. Very difficult, right? So it's very difficult to do it. Whereas if you look at language like Ruby, you can just say delegate. If you look at a language like Groovy, you simply say add delegate as an annotation, and bam, it acquires all the methods of this other object, and now they're part of you. So delegation is better than inheritance. Why? Because that gives you the function reuse, and JavaScript says, I don't, I don't have type information. When I don't have type information, what's the point in providing inheritance? If you really think about it, it makes no sense, right, to even try to do it. Am I making sense? Right? Am I making sense about not making sense? Yeah? So the point here is, when you have a language like Java, you use inheritance. Why? You say, hey, I want to take a man, and I want to send it to a human where a human is accepted, and I want you to type check and tell me it's OK to send a man where a human is expected. I know most women don't agree with it, right? They say, really? But yeah, please trust me, right? Most of the time, it works really well. So you say, I want to send this man where a human is expected. But JavaScript says that makes no sense, because I don't care the fact that it's human in the first place. All that I care about is it's an object, and I call methods and objects if it exists. So what you really, really want is a reuse of the method, not inheritance. So yes, JavaScript has inheritance, but really through method composition, not through the traditional inheritance we are familiar with. So if you really want to acquire those methods, right? you say, hey, you have a class, and every method of the class I should be able to call on this other class. Sure, you can do that. Well, how do you do it? Well, we already have the bag prototype. Simply take your prototype and point to the other object's instance, and remember what a prototype does. Any time it doesn't know what a method is, your object sends your method to the prototype. So if you tie the prototype with the instance of the other class you want to use, and bam, you have the methods that you really care about. And so it's pretty easy to do that. Let's look at an example here. So what I want to do here is simply say function base. And what am I going to do in the base? I'm going to create a function in the base. So base.prototype dot, let's say, f1 equals function. And what I'm going to do here is simply say print f1 called, right? Very simple code. So I want to create an arrive.prototype equals new base. So I took the derived, and I'm setting his prototype to the prototype of the base. So I'm going to say, hey, you. Your prototype is new of the base class. That's what I'm doing here, right? So now what happens? I can say bar d1 equals new derived d1 dot f1, calling the method on it. So you just acquired the other guy's method, right? By injecting that into your prototype. And if your goal of inheritance is to really reuse the methods, you got it. That's how simple it is to use it, right? And if your goal of inheritance was to really substitute the object, that concept doesn't exist in here. Why? Because if you look at language like Ruby, there's no you know, interfaces in Ruby. And you kind of sit there and say, how do we do interfaces in Ruby? Well, you could try to fit that through modules and all that. But at that point, it's clear sign you're using the language for the wrong purpose. So it's, it's where there's a bit of a, you know, it's like a culture, right? When you're in a language, you've got to learn how to program as programmers in that language of program. And that's the way things are done in JavaScript. And you kind of have to get used to it. And then you're much comfortable building applications within JavaScript. That becomes more effective. OK, so we did that so far. That looks good. You say, all right, Venkat, that's all great. But how do I write good quality code in JavaScript? The short, simplest answer is, that is hard, right? My good friend, uh, our good friend, Glenn Vanderberg, has a good statement. He says, bad programmers will move heaven and earth to write bad code. So if somebody is determined to write bad code, you could give the most beautiful language, and they will suck at it. They will make you say, whoa, 
you are, you, if you find a language which is foolproof, there's a bigger fool than that, that comes around. Yes? I'm the fool. Uh, I'm not talking about you specifically, <laughs> okay. but in general, the programmers, right? Um, to give you an example, I was talking to some developers, and they were telling me how their code sucks. They were saying, we have, um, this is a story that just surprised me. And they said, I have legacy code, and it's horrible to maintain. Methods are long. And I'm like, in my back of my mind, yeah, I know that. Right? Java code sucks. C sharp code sucks. And then they said, oh, by the way, we're working on a Ruby on Rails project. I'm not kidding with you. This happened yesterday. And I'm like, OK, Glenn, I hate to say it, but you're right. <laughs> right? And people will write bad code if they want to write bad code. But if you want to write good code in any language, except Perl, you can write good code. <laughs> right? Absolutely. So yes, you can write good code in JavaScript. You say, OK, that's great, but how do I know I'm writing good code? Well, there's one way to know you're writing good code. Ask somebody to read it. You show it to them, and they kick and scream. It's like, oh, never mind, sit down. I'll come back tomorrow, right? And I'll modify this, refactor it. Well, that's one way to do it. Well, but is there another way to really get, you know, make sure the code is good? Well, there's a gentleman named uh, Douglas Crackford, and what he did is he decided to do something about it. And, and this is the beauty, right? You know, I, I, I was uh, teaching a course in a company uh, last week uh, in, in California, and I showed them a beautiful tool which solves problem wonderfully. And, and this programmer looks at me and says, I got a question for you. What if my problem specifically doesn't fit into that tool? I felt like crying, right? I mean, you show this beautiful tool, and all that he can ask you is, what if my need doesn't fit into it perfectly? There's only a 95% fit. What do I do? And my answer to him is, well, here's, what, here's the possibility. Not that you should do it, but here's the possibility. I know programmers who have a full-time job. They work 8 to 5, 8 to 6. They rush home only to turn on their computers and work for the next 7 hours on a pet project. And every tool, quality tool out there, was created by somebody who has passion and no life. <laughs> so if you're really passionate and you don't have life, and he said, I have life, but what about wife? I said, let's not go over there, <laughs> right? So if you're passionate about it, you can go create. And that's exactly what Douglas did. He said, hey, you know what? I do a lot of JavaScript coding, and I want to find a way to improve the quality. So he wrote JS Lint. The only thing I would recommend before you try JS Lint is you sit down, because it's going to come insult you in every possible way. Right? You take two lines of JavaScript, and it says, what were you thinking? <laughs> and it's like, OK, fine, fine, fine. So that's a fantastic tool. So I recommend that you run your code through JS Lint. And JS Lint is like you know, FXCOP for C Sharp, or it's like fine bugs for Java. It'll analyze every. And the beauty is, you simply, it's a web page. You don't even have to install it. You just go to JS Lint, and it's a website. You copy and paste. We are really familiar with that in JavaScript, right? So you copy and paste it. You click the you know, button, and it tells you how it sucks. But there's something you can do about it. And you can fix it, then copy and paste in your code, and you got a better code than the one you copied and pasted from. And that's a good deal, isn't it? So I cannot recommend JS, JS Lint uh, enough. I actually gave a talk on JS Lint, and it was a very difficult talk. Why? Not because JS Lint is not good. It's because I look over in the very last row was Douglas sitting in there, intently watching me as I'm telling him how to use his tool. I was nervous giving this talk. So I said, I will give this talk again, but do promise he's not going to be in the conference, right? But it was a lot of fun. He kind of you know, looked at it and he said, OK, not bad. And he kind of walked away. So absolutely, it's a great tool. And I'll be more than happy to talk about JS Lint in a separate talk if that's interesting. But it's a fantastic tool to use. You say, OK, that's nice, but unit testing. I'm passionate about unit testing, but how do I do it? 
And you say, okay, unit testing is great, but I got this HTML page with the JavaScript in it. I cannot test it. Well, you go to the doctor and say, doctor, if I do this, it hurts. What the doctor say first? Don't do it, right? <laughs> That's the first thing you do is you know it's a bad practice, so quit putting JavaScript within HTML. My good friend Neil Ford and, my, and I uh, talked about unit testing JavaScript in one of the conferences. We paired up and we did this session together. And as we started this session, there was a guy right in the front row, and we are starting this talk. It's a workshop, three hours, we're just starting, and the guy raises his hand and says, I have a lot of JavaScript, I've tried hard to unit test them, it doesn't work, it sucks. And we haven't even started speaking. We said, that's very motivating, thank you. <laughs> if you would please be quiet now and wait for us to finish this talk, we'll be more than happy. And we went through the talk, about half the way through, the exact same guy raises the hand. It's like, oh dear, okay, what's up now? He says, now I understand why my JavaScript is not testable. I was like, why? And he said, I've been doing this wrong. I've been putting all my JavaScript in HTML, and there is no easy way to reach in. So what is more important is this. Remember one thing. You saw how flexible JavaScript is. You can go modify variables on it if you want to. So what you do is, you write your HTML page, you keep your JavaScript in a separate file. And your JavaScript says, go to that input label and modify that value. So most likely, what are you doing in your JavaScript? Here's what you're doing, right? You are saying something like this. You are saying in your JavaScript, you know, do some work. And within this method, there's a function. And what are you doing in here? You are saying something like document dot get element by ID, whatever the ID was, dot value equals something, and then you go on to do more things. Make sense? There's a name for what we just did here. What is that? Coupling. A coupled code is a crippled code. So what do you do normally in unit testing? You decouple things. So what would I do? What I would do in this case is I would first say here, element, whatever that element is, I pass it as a parameter to it, and here I would say element dot value is that. But look at what you just did. In your mind you're thinking this element is that element with that ID that you're going to modify, but JavaScript doesn't care. So what you do is you create a very lightweight mock object. Think about this. JavaScript is typeless. It doesn't care what you gave it. So what you do in your unit test is you create this little stupid object, also known as mock, and all that it contains is one property whose name is value, and you send to him, and he's so happy. He's like, thank you. You have a value. I'm setting it on you. Your unit test is passing. And then when you call it from the UI, you basically say get element by ID and pass it to the function. This is common practice, and yet it's so difficult for us to do. Why? Because we don't have the discipline when it comes to JavaScript. We somehow think it's got to go in the HTML. And it's not your fault. It's all the websites you copied your code from is the fault, right? If you had seen a code that was so nicely written, that wouldn't be the problem. But we know that the days when JavaScript came out, we didn't quite know unit testing as much. There were a couple of guys like Ken Beck who were doing it. The rest of us were writing messy code. So we didn't have the opportunity to learn from a you know, good code, so that's not our fault. But now that you have seen that, there's no more excuses, right? So you can unit test every line of useful JavaScript, and when somebody tells you, keep this in mind, if somebody tells you, my code is not testable, what they're telling you is, my design sucks. If you design it properly, you can test it. And JavaScript is no exception for it. You can test every line of JavaScript if you want to really test it. Well, I hope that was useful for you. That is all I have. Thank you.